Greetings. I'm delighted to welcome you or welcome you back to the second lecture of the Pandemics in History series with Professor Michael Rossi. Today, the topic is cholera and the rise of public health. You have just been listening to the Cholera Cantata by Fanny Mendelssohn. This piece was composed in honor of the victims of the Berlin, Chol Berlin cholera epidemic of 1831. My name is Emily Lynn Osborne, and I am the Interim Dean of the Graham School of Continuing Professional and Liberal Studies. I am also an Associate Professor in the Department of History here at the University of Chicago. The lecture we are recording today is based on a talk that was given last Wednesday, May 27th. We had some technical difficulties with making a recording of the original lecture, and so we are making a new today with three people in attendance, myself, our speaker, Michael Rossi, and Zoe Eisenman, Graham's Director of Academics. We will reconstitute the essential elements of the original talk with some modifications. We will refer to questions that were asked before, but we will also ask our own, both during the lecture and afterwards. Today, our speaker, Michael Rossi, will be introduced by Zoe Eisenman. In so doing, she will say a few words about the basic program which is our continuing education program dedicated to reading foundational texts. It is one of the crown jewels of Graham School's liberal arts offerings. This program has acquired a devoted following of students, some of whom have taken courses for years, year in and year out. To find out why, I turn to Zoe. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to all, and now to Zoe. Thank you, Emily. As Interim Dean Osborne mentioned, before I introduce Professor Rossi, I would like to tell you a little bit about the basic program of liberal education for adults. Courses in our great book style program are led by instructors grounded in interdisciplinary studies and practiced in the art of leading discussion. Our intensive curriculum and rigorous approach attracts a dedicated community of adult learners who engage in close reading and discussion of some of the foundation, foundational texts of Western culture without the stress of papers or exams. Many of our students continue to study with us for many years after they've finished the initial four-year certificate, as Interim Dean Osborne mentioned. One such group is our Thursday morning alumni group known as Nancy Brant's group, now going into their 15th year. You may have heard about them in the recent news articles. Um, all of our courses are currently offered remotely, providing students a way to connect with each other and the texts and topics they are passionate about even as they are sheltering in place. Our summer courses are open to all and are a great way to get a sense of our educational experience while learning something new. Registration for these courses is open now and registration for year one of the certificate, which begins in autumn 2020, will open in July. And now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Michael Rossi is an assistant professor of science and medicine in the Department of History here at the University of Chicago. As of July 1st, Michael will be associate professor for he earned tenure this past academic year. Michael teaches classes on medicine, disease, and society from the 16th century to the present day. His book, The Republic of Color, Science, Perception, and the Making of Modern America, published by the University of Chicago Press, investigates the intersections of color theory with politics and ideas about aesthetics at the turn of the 20th century. Professor Rossi has published widely in both popular and scholarly peer-reviewed publications. And now I'd like to turn it over to Professor Rossi. All right, thank you, Zoe, and thank you, Emily. Um, and I wanna say thank you also to uh, everyone behind the scenes who is helping to make this possible. Uh, and also um, thank you to all those of you who are watching at home uh, for joining us uh, in this uh, discussion. Uh, so first, I would like once again to offer a word of caution. Uh, for this session and for subsequent ones, we will sometimes be dealing with vivid and possibly disturbing um, images and descriptions. They're necessary for our purposes because they represent people's efforts to make sense of sickness, suffering. But sometimes they may be unsuitable, depending on your disposition or those around you. Uh, second, I just want to... Uh, uh, reiterate what uh, was said just now. Uh, we will, uh, we'll of course, not be having the live Q and A session that we had before, but we will repeat the questions um, that were that were offered in, during the original 
the original um, run of this lecture. Uh, finally, there is, a, uh, there is a list of the images used and their attributions at the end of the talk, uh, and we will put up a bibliography online in the location um, uh, that will be clear after the talk. Uh, and so uh, with that, oh uh, yes, and so with that, um, let us turn to uh, cholera and the rise of public health. And so we will begin with the poet Heinrich Heine, uh, who was in Paris when cholera struck in 1832. He writes, its arrival was officially announced on the 29th of March. And on the boulevards, one could even see dancers in costumes that mocked the fear of cholera and the disease itself. That night, the balls were more crowded than usual. Excessive laughter almost drowned the roar of music. People grew hot. All kinds of ices and cold beverages were in great demand. All at once, the merriest of the Harlequins felt that his legs were becoming much too cold, and he took off his mask when, to the amazement of all, a violet blue face became visible. It was at once seen that there was no jest in this. The laughter died away, and at once several carriages conveyed men and women from the ball to the central hospital where they, still arrayed in masked attire, soon died. As, in the first shock of terror, people believed cholera was contagious, and as those who were already patients in the hospital raised cruel screams of fear, it is said that these dead were buried so promptly that even in their fantastic fool's garments, uh, the, even their fantastic fool's garments were left on them, so that as they lived, they now lie merrily in the grave. This was cholera's first visit to Paris, but it wouldn't be the last. Over the course of the 19th century, cholera circled the globe in five pandemic waves. Each time, it left suffering and death in its wake, but also new ways of envisioning disease. Like the plague, which we discussed last time, Cholera is a bacterial infection, although cholera, unlike plague, is transmitted through water rather than fleas or the air. And like plague, cholera was fast acting, lethal, and terrifying in symptoms, as we shall see. Uh, it was not, of course, the only other form of pandemic disease in the world. Syphilis had followed hard on the heels of plague, spreading all over Europe uh, in the 1490s. Pandemic smallpox had eradicated indigenous populations in North and South America between 1500 and 1800. Yellow fever, typhus, and typhoid cyclically plagued colonies and metropoles. But cholera was, in many ways, the first modern pandemic. Modern in the sense of being propagated through the infrastructures of industrialization, colonialism, and urbanization. Modern in the sense of moving scientific debates away from general humoral theories to specific ideas of pathogens. Modern in the sense of solidifying ideas about disease health and politics that form the bedrock of contemporary public health strategies. So last time our goals were to understand plague in terms of the medical systems of plague sufferers. And today our goals will be similar. But whereas during times of plague, it was the divine and the abstract that helped to define disease, in times of cholera, it was the state and statecraft and science that helped to define disease. And what we're gonna see is that while halting at first, the idea of fusing medicine and government with science comes to seem like not just a good idea, but in fact an obligation of the very idea of government itself. Uh, for government to do any less by the end of the 19th century was to be asleep on the job. So to get at this, I want to once again proceed in three parts. First, I want to look at some observations of cholera, uh, especially uh, as we might compare it to the plague, uh, to see how it was understood, how it was described, um, how it was depicted, uh, as for instance in this print entitled Cholera in Paris from 1865. Then I want to look at theories of cholera and specifically how different theories about what caused cholera worked better and worse with different theories about the responsibility of government in the face of sickness. And remember we saw a little bit of this last time um, with plague, but now we'll see it in a uh, much more developed fashion. Finally, I want to look quickly at the place of the development of the germ theory of disease with respect to public health. Remember, for much of the period that we've been describing, this is from before 1300, right on up through the middle of the 19th century, there was very little sense that microbes caused disease. This changed in the 1860s with the development of the germ theory of disease. That is to say the idea that 
specific identifiable microbes cause specific diseases, and that these microbes can be stopped from harming humans by paying attention to their particular natural histories. So one might think that this seemingly obvious fact about disease, once it was revealed, would change public health practice entirely. But history is more complicated than that, and cholera, with the, uh, cholera, the great pandemic of the 19th century, will help us to see that. Okay, so let's start with some observations about cholera. What was cholera? Uh, how might we describe it from the perspective of the 19th century? So cholera had been well known to people living in India's Ganges Delta, right around here, uh, for hundreds if not thousands of years. And it was feared among British colonial troops by the turn of the 19th century. The first, epi uh, the first episode of pandemic cholera emerged in 1817, when British troop movements and railroad lines carried cholera out of the Ganges Delta and into Afghanistan, uh, the Persian Gulf, China, and Russia. Thereafter, it spread, reaching Europe and North and South America in a second pandemic wave beginning in 1832. A third wave followed in 1852, a fourth in the 1860s through 1870s, and a fifth in 1881 to 1882. In terms of its description, cholera was fast acting, often lethal and distinct in appearance. Onset of disease was painful cramping and a gurgling in the bowels. Symptoms would come fast. People, people could be struck anywhere, at home, at work, on a tram, in the streets, uh, at a garden party like this gentleman here. Um, and they would have sudden bouts of vomiting and copious, highly liquid, liquid diarrhea, often called rice water because it was thin, cloudy, and slightly whitish or yellowish. This extreme fluid loss would quickly lead to dehydration and patients' faces and bodies would become drawn and emaciated. Their eyes would sink into their skulls. Their skin would grow brittle and they would exhibit a characteristic blue tint. Death, when it came, often came fast sometimes within five to 12 hours of the first symptoms, though sometimes more. Cholera was not as virulent as plague. It didn't kill as many people per number of people infected, but death was fast and extremely unpleasant. As with plague, we see that social disruption followed in the wake of the disease. Developments in communication by the 19th century meant that people often knew of the approach of cholera before it actually arrived. This is a situation that created anxiety many of the wealthy fled, as in the case of plague, causing grumbling among their communities. For those who were forced to stay in cholera-ridden cities and towns, the anxiety often turned toxic. There are instances recorded where individuals suspected of spreading cholera were beaten to death by mobs. The scapegoating, again often of ethnic mi minorities, was common. As with plague, people viewed each other with suspicion, looking for signs of the onset of disease. And so in this slide, we see here, a pregnant woman says that she feels gurgling in her belly, uh, presumably alluding to her unborn child. Uh, and here, her companion recoils in fear, uh, afraid that it is cholera. Still other people turned to dubious cures and quack medicine thrived. Uh, in this slide here, labeled uh, cholera phobia, or, or cholera phobia, uh, this is from 1831. Uh, here we see a crowd gathering around a pharmacist who's dispensing cholera cures. And we might know the diversity of their wishes. So uh, this man here calls for soap. Um, this man here calls for uh, spirits of wine and mustard. Uh, here someone's calling for camphor. Uh, here's, another, uh, here's another request for camphor here. Um, it's worth mentioning also, uh, thinking about our own present moment, uh, that we have on record at least one individual in 1832 uh, who died after ingesting uh, disinfectant. Uh, and this was not bleach. Uh, but a sulfuric acid solution, uh, and this person did so to the best of my knowledge, not on any official recommendation. Um, nevertheless, considering the historical analogy to our own time, uh, this may give you a dim view of human progress indeed. Finally, to conclude this line of thinking, all the things that I've been mentioning have a rough equivalence with reactions to the plague, but I also want to point out a significant but subtle change that we see towards depictions of cholera as compared with plague. Because whereas plague was most often depicted as death itself, an inevitable end, cholera often takes the form of various monsters or grotesqueries, still frightening, but ultimately potentially conquerable. And so here we see a, um, a uh, etching, a hand-colored etching by, um, excuse me, a lithograph 
uh, by the, the well-known French illustrator Granville from 1833, uh, and he's entitled this cholera, uh, the monster that feeds on the world, or it, it comes to feed on the world. Um, let's see, so this cholera is a monster. Uh, here we see cholera in another illustration. We see, for instance, cholera depicted as a caricature of a colonial subject from India. Um, this suggests that the problem was not divine or a matter of, sort of cosmic natural scale forces, but was very much a human scale problem that could be dealt with with the instruments of human scale government. Um, and here finally we see another cholera monster slide. Uh, this is cholera and barbarism. So uh, barbarism is the giant sort of uh, lashing out uh, blindly at society uh, with cholera following behind. Um, and note here though that again, cholera as death does not stand alone, but it's fundamentally linked to the problem of barbarism or a, a social problem, a matter of uh, social uplift is what reformers at the time would say. Um, and so all this is to say, that, well, all this is not to say that we never see cholera as death personified. We, we do see it as death personified. Uh, and it's certainly not to say that cholera was itself seen as a living entity, at least not until the very end of the 19th century. But what I wanna call atten your attention to here is the difference between portraying disease as death itself, which cannot be controlled, and portraying disease as a monster, which even if uh, huge and implacable and terrifying, is at least, at least implicitly defeatable. And so maybe, uh, maybe this would be a good place to stop for some questions. Okay. Um, so the first question we have is, when did the idea of contagion appear? Okay, so uh, this is a good question. So the idea of contagion is an old one. Um, we see it as early, well, we see it even earlier than, um, than the 1490s, but it's, it's first articulated by a um, physician named Fracastorius uh, with, with respect to um, syphilis and plague in the 1400s. Uh, and Fracastorius refers to things called, that he calls seeds or viruses that may be ways of transmitting individuals from one person to another, uh, excuse me, transmitting disease from one person to another. Um, however, this was the minority view, and also Fracastorius did not, um, to the best of my knowledge, think that these uh, seeds or vir virus by virus, he simply meant a particle or something virulent, right? He didn't mean a living uh, or quasi-living biological entity. Um, so he just meant a, a particle of some sort. Um, so the idea of contagion is old. Uh, it is, however, uh, Fracastorius was in the minority view for, uh, for hundreds of years. So uh, if you are a scholarly or educated physician of the, um, well, basically of, of the roughly thousand years before, uh, before the 19th century, uh, you would likely not think that disease was, uh, was caused by contagion, right? You would think that it was caused by some sort of confluence of envir environmental forces and, and humors, which we'll review uh, presently. Um, so, contagion, so contagion was an idea that was around, again, not at all a majority medical opinion, uh, usually held by peasants and the uneducated. Right? So if you, were, um, if you were a superstitious person, you would believe in contagion. If you were an educated person, uh, you would not. Um, what kind of magical potions were being prescribed in the era of cholera and how do they relate to today's pandemics? So, um, Tackling the second part of the question first, I would say that I do not have uh, much of a sense of uh, today's sort of today's uh, supernatural thinking regarding COVID-19. Um, I haven't seen too much too much that what strikes me as resonating very well with um, uh, resonating well with, with prior uh, pandemics. However, uh, what we do see in times of cholera and indeed uh, times of um, pandemic influenza, which we will be talking about next time, um, what we do see is appeals to the same sorts of saints that were appealed to uh, in times of plague. Uh, so for instance, uh, we see appeals to uh, Saint Rock, uh, who is this, um, who's a plague saint of the uh, 14th century, 14th and 15th centuries. Um, and the idea is you might have a, a medallion bearing an image of Saint Rock or maybe like a, um, or maybe you'd have like a piece of paper uh, with his image on it. And you would use that to ward off, um, well, you'd use it for plague in the 1300s uh, through the 1500s, 1600s, and you would use it uh, for cholera in the 19th century. Um, so again, whether that, whether we want class religion as a, as a magic of some sort, um, I suppose is a matter that could be debated further, but um, we, do see, we do see a real continuity 
in terms of the types of, for instance, saints that one might pay, one might pray to uh, in order for alleviation from uh, from sickness. Okay. Uh, and so, actually, I think that maybe that gets us uh, that gets us in a good position to uh, to move on, uh, since the problem of uh, since the problem of describing um, how one you know who one prays to or how one how one thinks about uh, alleviating suffering from disease. Uh, is fundamentally based on causes, and causes are based on theories of disease. Uh, it makes a good uh, makes a good way to makes a good point to move on uh, to our next section about uh, theories of uh, cholera. All right. So, um, so from what we just seen, uh, those facing cholera reacted in very general terms, uh, much in the same way as we saw uh, last time with those who faced plague. Uh, so some people fled, uh, some panicked. Uh, some looked to unorthodox medical cures. Um, as the last question just noted, some people some people prayed. I, I, um, I didn't list a prayer as among uh, the reactions, but certainly there was a there was a large uh, element of uh, praying for uh, for relief from cholera, praying for forgiveness, things like this. Um, all of which, again, we see in plague times as well. But we also want to keep in mind that the first cholera pandemics took place in a world that was much more populated. Uh, much more industrialized or industrializing, uh, and in a world much more interconnected through steam and rail technologies, uh, and importantly, a world in which a new form of medicine was uh, taking hold. Uh, and this was a form of medicine which increasingly viewed disease through the lens of sciences, uh, sciences like chemistry, uh, like anatomy, like physiology, statistics, uh, and so forth. Um, now, this did not mean that the humoral medicine that we saw last week was uh, gone exactly. Uh, so the name, uh, the name cholera itself, of course, uh, refers to yellow bile, the choleric humor. Um, and here, if you remember from last time, this is our system of humors. Uh, here we have yellow bile. Our four humors are yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. Um, and each of these four humors are um, uh, connected with certain temperaments. So yellow bile is, con is connected with a choleric temperament black bile with a melancholic temperament, phlegm with phlegmatic temperament, and uh, uh, blood with a sanguinary temperament. Um, and of course, they also have sort of uh, um, different qualities uh, re represented uh, that represent them. So like yellow bile is a hot and dry, um, a hot and dry humor. Uh, it's also associated with the element of fire. And so you can see from, they have all these associations built in on this chart. Um, and so when you sort of see things like this, it's easy to imagine um, uh, it's easy to imagine how one might see the disease as, in fact, simply a symptom of humoral imbalance. And so the idea is when the symptom, when the humors are out of balance, uh, the patient is unwell. And depending on what humors are, what kinds of humors are out of balance and which ones are uh, favored or depleted, you get different kinds of sickness. And so seen that way, you can imagine uh, cholera uh, being a symptom of humoral imbalance insofar as uh, the patient expels pale yellow rice water diarrhea or, or vomits, uh, pale yellow vomit. Uh, and this seems like evidence of an overabundance of pale yellow color in the body. Right? So the body's producing too much color under the system and you need to expel it. Nevertheless, uh, since the end of the 18th century, uh, academic doctors had increasingly abandoned humoral exp uh, explanations for those, uh, in favor of those drawn from natural philosophy or what we call science today. Uh, within this milieu of sort of really more uh, scientific thinking, uh, the more scientific uh, approach to medicine, there are two main lines of, uh, of uh, theory as to what caused cholera uh, and how, uh, therefore, uh, to affect cures for it. And these two theories were uh, theories of contagionism and theories of miasma or anti-contagionism. Uh, so <clears throat> pay close attention. Uh, while at first it might seem like these theories are variations on what we saw with the plague, they are in fact quite different, uh, and their meanings are modulated by the politics and medical beliefs uh, in the time of cholera. So let's talk about contagionism first. So perhaps predictably, one of the first things that people thought when confronted with cholera was that this was an entity like the plague. It was after all frightening, fast acting, and killed people horribly. It also seemed to affect people in proximity to one another, uh, so one of the first thoughts was that cholera, like the plague, was contagious. And remember, at this time, contagious meant simply passed from one person to another. Uh, it did not necessarily imply a microbe, uh, imply that a microbe was being passed from one person to another, um, at least not until the end of the 19th century. 
Uh, and so uh, one early official reaction based on this idea was to impose the same measures that were found to be effective against plague uh, on cholera, so, uh, on victims of cholera. I'm referring to here to things like, um, like quarantines, uh, like cordon sanitaire, uh, to keep people who had cholera, so people who are like migrants, immigrants who have cholera, um, out of places that don't have cholera. And, or, or in the case of cordon sanitaire, to keep uh, people who have cholera from in a, in a small location, to keep them from getting out. Um, and so here we see, for instance, a scene of uh, a, some noble person, I can't remember who, uh, visiting a, a lazaretto, visiting a cholera hospital. This is where cholera patients would be interred until they were either dead or free of cholera. Um, let's see. Uh, so, um, and yeah, so we see the use of pest houses or lazarettos like this one to confine and isolate cholera sufferers. Uh, we see programs to uh, burn or dispose of the clothing and belongings of cholera sufferers. Uh, we see policies to ensure the rapid burial of bodies to eliminate sources of contagion, um, as, with this, uh, as with this group in Palermo uh, during the cholera outbreak of 1835. This is a group of people who are going along collecting bodies. Um, so rapid, in fact, was the burial of bodies of cholera patients uh, that we see an abiding fear of premature burial as one of the sort of tertiary effects, one might say, of early cholera pandemics. Uh, so here in this uh, rather vivid painting, a patient recovers from his bout of cholera only to discover that he's been buried alive. So the problem with these measures uh, was that they proved both ineffective, they did not work to stop the spread of cholera, and they were extremely provocative to the populations on which they were imposed. So we now say that cholera is transmitted principally through consuming contaminated water, uh, especially in areas where, for instance, whole communities might get their water from a contaminated source or where the possibility of exposure to sewage is high or both. Uh, so for instance, this would have been the case uh, uh, with most of the open sewers that were common to cities of the 19th century. And here we see a scene from Exeter during a cholera outbreak. Uh, these men here are collecting the belongings of a cholera victim, uh, presumably for, um, for burning or some other form of disposal. Uh, the idea is that this is supposed to avoid uh, Content, like the, the contagion being passed from belongings to other human beings. Uh, but of course, you can see that they're, they're, they're doing their work over an open sewer, which would have posed um, just as much a risk of, uh, of infection uh, as the clothing that they were handling. Um, so, okay, so first of all, quarantines, uh, cordon sanitaire, things like this, um, uh, pest houses, not, not, not very effective at, uh, at stopping cholera. Moreover, uh, cholera did not harm everyone equally. Uh, as it became abundantly clear. Um, doctors in particular uh, seemed less likely to get cholera than other people, even though they were around cholera patients all the time. Uh, and so this could make cholera look like something of a sinister medical fraud, a way, uh, well, at best a way of scaring people into giving doctors their money. Uh, so here in this um, lithograph from 1832, uh, we see a bunch of doctors here have uh, created a, an effigy of cholera, and they're using it to scare, uh, to scare their patients uh, into seeking treatment and and um, and giving the doctors money uh, for what is clearly a, a simply a, a a bogus a bogus disease. Um, so in this case, again, so some people it was possible to argue that cholera was simply a medical fraud that didn't really exist, right? Since cholera, since doctors did not get the very same cholera that uh, that they that their patients did, um, this uh, this sort of differential. Uh, this differential rate of contagion or of, uh, of sickness um, also made confinement and quarantine seem unjust and possibly even like a conspiratorial effort to poison and kill the poor uh, who are the most likely to be confined. Uh, this led to riots in which quarantine houses were broken into and the physicians and public health uh, officials who attempted to enforce quarantine uh, were beaten and in some cases killed. Right, so quarantine tended to be both ineffective and socially destabilizing. Well, if cholera was not precisely contagious, then the other theory was that perhaps it was caused by miasma or bad air. This too seems like a theory that we encountered with plague, uh, the idea that noxious airs generate epidemic disease. But instead of being generated by a conjunction of, unfor uh, of unfortunate astrological events, as was the belief in times of plague, miasma or bad air in the 19th century was said to be caused by the chemical fermentation of decaying matter a decaying filth, as it was often called, uh, that emanated, uh, usually from the ground or from water, uh, and induced cholera in people. 
And all this helped to explain the prevalence of cholera among impoverished people, particularly those who lived in film, uh, like the urban poor or like colonial subjects. And so here you see uh, a, um, an illustration labeled a court for King Cholera. And this is all of the uh, uh, residents of this sort of impoverished urban neighborhood. And you can see this is a pile of sort of, of quote unquote filth that the children are playing on. And what you might imagine if you were a miasmatist or an anti-contagionist is that this sort of this pile of debris and the sort of presumably what would be like the mud and debris on the street uh, would kind of would decay, would ferment and create sort of clouds of this noxious miasma, which would then induce cholera uh, in the population. Um, and this of course explains why uh, the urban poor were more likely to get cholera uh, than the physicians, for instance, who were, um, who were treating them because the physicians would tend to live in nicer neighborhoods uh, and not be as subject to the, uh, uh, to the perils of filth. Um, all right, so in the face of miasmas, of course, um, quarantine would do no good. Instead, what was necessary were public works, municipal efforts to reduce the sources of filth that led to cholera. This meant, for instance, street cleaning regimens, uh, like this one. This is a, uh, a street cleaning team in London in 1892. Uh, the caption here says an, says an anti-cholera specific. Uh, specific at the time uh, was a word that would mean a specific treatment for a specific disease. And so the idea here is that street cleaning is the, um, is the cure for cholera, right? It's the medicine that you need to, to give the city in order to be rid of cholera. Um, so street cleaning uh, details like this would be one municipal effort to, um, uh, to reduce the sources of filth that led to cholera. Um, we might also see installing underground sewers as a, that drained out of the city um, as another way of, um, of controlling cholera, again, if you were a miasmatist. Um, so the miasmatic, miasmatic prevention methods also meant efforts to provide places for the unwashed masses to wash. Um, and indeed, by the time of the fourth pandemic, uh, many cities had established standing or permanent boards of health. And these boards of health would sort of continually inspect the city for sources of ferment and disease, um, not just in times of cholera or epidemic disease, but all the time right, as, a, as a means of preventing disease rather than sort of reacting to the emergence of disease. Um, and again, these boards of health would, it would keep the city sort of uh, inspected and free of filth um, and would mandate the creation of sanitary infrastructures, so things that would help to reduce filth and then prevent epidemic sickness. Um, so just to give two sort of uh, uh, two examples, uh, we don't think about these things as medical technologies today, uh, but the egg-shaped sewer, uh, for instance, was one of the most influential med medical technologies of its day. Uh, the egg shape makes it sort of self-cleaning. Um, and the idea here is that rather than having uh, uh, water and other and, and filth stagnating in the sewer, um, you would, have, you would you know, uh, sluice off into, uh, presumably into the nearest uh, source of, uh, the nearest water source, nearest river or whatever. Um, so again, sewers as one sort of medical technology of the, uh, of the great period of sanitation and hygiene. Um, we also don't think about municipal swimming pools as medical technologies, but they were originally part of the effort to provide bathing spaces for the urban poor. Again, as part of an effort to stave off infectious diseases like cholera, this would be the 1880s. All right, so on the one hand, it is possible to be, it was possible to be skeptical of the idea of paying public funds to health inspectors uh, in order that they should detect an invisible ailment. It seems like an invitation to graft, as this cartoon here makes clear. So here are some health inspectors uh, sort of looking for this invisible entity. Um, and here two in new inspectors are saying, um, positively, we, we must find something. It won't do to lose our 20 guineas a day. So the idea here is that um, they're sort of, they're, they're looking for something that they can call cholera uh, in, order to, uh, in order to get paid, right? And it's sort of the whole idea is that this is all just a, uh, a scam on the part of the, um, on the Board of Health. Um, so that's on the one hand. However, compared to methods based on contagion, miasmatic measures tended to have the widespread support of the mercantile classes that increasingly made up the economic backbones of, of 19th century cities. So quarantine was expensive, uh, particularly to business owners. Quarantine meant goods couldn't move. Quarantine meant businesses had to close. Quarantine meant workers couldn't report to work, uh, couldn't report to work. Um, in contrast, uh, public works, while publicly expensive, enabled rather than restricted the flow of commerce, even in times of epidemic disease. And so uh, if one favored fewer restrictions to commerce, 
one would tend to believe that cholera was miasmatic rather than contagious, and would therefore believe that the solution was to have the government do what this greedy plutocrat will not do, that is, clean up the city in case cholera moves in. And so here we see cholera uh, telling this, land, uh, this landlord here that, uh, that he, cholera, will be moving into the tenements um, because the, the landlord hasn't been investing in the, in the upkeep of his buildings, right? And so um, this is, again, this is, making a, this is making an economic argument uh, based on miasmatism, right? So landlords, you better take care of your apartments, uh, otherwise you will cause miasma, which will then affect your bottom line. Um, so um, these theories, contagionism, miasmatism, humorism, uh, humoralism, uh, it should be emphasized, uh, were not uh, discrete or um, exclusive ideas, uh, but they were concepts which, which could be mixed and matched. Uh, so for instance, one could combine the miasmatic theory with a sort of humoralism to suppose that miasmas affected those with a humoral disposition to be affected, right? So the idea here is that um, if you have the sort of disposition that, the humoral disposition that would uh, make you a, an individual who would uh, be impoverished, right? Since, uh, since the, the line of thinking is that poverty is, a, is an intrinsic condition, if the poor have a humoral disposition that uh, forces them to be poor, basically or to adopt habits which will make them poor, like lack of industry, sloth, things like this. Um, they, the, same sort of, the same sorts of humoral mix that would make you uh, poor would also make you susceptible to, um, to the miasmas of uh, the, 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 the miasmas that cause cholera, right? Uh, and this in turn suggests that uh, no sanitary program should be undertaken um, since of course the very humoral disposition that makes people poor also makes them susceptible to cholera. Right. Um, and I should say this, this does need to be a humoral argument. Uh, one sees it made, for instance, through genetics in the, 18, in the 1960s and 1970s um, about very similar things. And so here, just we also see uh, in this cartoon, this is just a, um, this is parodying the idea that, that, this is parodying sort of people who are against reform, saying that the system works so well. And here you can see that you know, a number of uh, wealthy burgers are sort of feeding on the public trough. Uh, while the uh, while the impoverished are in uh, in squalor and presumably disease as well, this is from the eighteen. Ooh, I want to say this is from the eighteen thirties, I believe. Um, or uh, so that's one way that you can mix and match uh, humoralism and miasma miasmatism. Uh, if one was of a more liberal or reformist bent, uh, one could also view the miasmatic properties of filth as properties which stimulated the contagiousness of cholera. All right, um, so here, this ca the caption of this print of a New York slum here says, um, quote, there is such an utter neglect of ventilation and purification of these tenement blocks that they are perpetual fever nests, ready to nourish and force into deadly activity any contagion that may lodge in them. Right? And so the idea here is that in this case, a filth causes miasma, but miasma stimulates the contagious particles. Right? So um, this is a hybrid of the miasma and contagionist theories sometimes called contingent contagionism. Okay, so uh, all this to say we see a panoply, uh, a panoply of different approaches, uh, but by the end of the 19th century, uh, these approaches tend in most places towards the enforcement of public health and sanitation programs based on theories of miasmatism. The idea here is clean up filth and you would clean up disease and everyone would be better for it. Um, so again, maybe now is a good point to take uh, some more questions. All right. Well, how about this question? Um, so if public health efforts targeted cleaning up filth of the urban poor, how did the colonialism in public health work? Um, with, for example, the British in India, were there colonial public health initiatives or were the Indian people treated differently than the poor in London, for example? So great. So this is a, um, this is a question which, uh, Emily, you could also weigh in on. Um, the, uh, the short answer is that, um, that, yeah, so that public health programs and so the idea of cleaning up, um, uh, cleaning up the quote unquote filth of, uh, of, of colonial spaces as well, uh, becomes a, um, uh, becomes a reason, becomes a justification for, uh, for colonial domination as well. So the idea is that, and this is also, but this is also ties in with the slide we saw about cholera and barbarism, right? So the idea is that, um, if you have a certain view of the evolution of human societies, you might think that colonial people are barbaric, right? So sort of semi-civilized. Uh, and it's the duty of the civilized to, uh, um, to bring civilization to, to, uh, to barbarism, right? And so the idea is that you would do this in part, and there's a number of ways you do this, but part of the way you do this was by, um, 
creating these sort of public health infrastructures, which uh, forced barbaric people to adopt the ways of, um, of, uh, of uh, their occupying powers, right? So, um, and this would, you know, this would go to the levels of, again, like this would be things like street cleaning and sanitation. It would also be things like um, the performance of uh, particular kinds of uh, kinds of hygiene, kinds of cleanliness. Um, it could even involve things like sitting, like how people sit could be a source of um, of uh, negative uh, public health outcomes, right? So it's really a, it becomes the justification for reshaping um, not only not only cities but you know people's very uh, uh, very minute aspects of people's behaviors. Um, Emily and. Uh, yeah, I would just add that the colonies, the colonizers often ran all sorts of experiments in the colonies from public health initiatives to urban planning to medical experiments. And then they would learn from there and then transport some of that, that, that knowledge back and use it in the metropole, whether to, ma to manage London's urban poor or reform their cities. Right. Um, I'll ask the next question. How was medical research conducted, published, and distributed? It's a big question, but, and also, it also brings us to our reading. So maybe we should, no. Well, we'll get to that at the end. Uh, but yes, could you talk a bit about that? Sure, well, yeah, we can, I'll answer it briefly and then we can circle around in a little bit more depth now. Um, well, uh, so, Last time we saw that uh, when we're talking about play, I guess the best way to say this is in contrast, right? So when we're talking about play, we had a sense of uh, just many, many sort of different theories flying around, often based on Galenic traditions of disease, right? These traditions that have been passed on for uh, hundreds, uh, hundreds of years uh, at that point. Um, uh, and again, we, we see sort of very, very loose, uh, loose networks of, um, of scholars, often sort of in dialogue over particular texts rather than um, uh, rather than over empirical observations. Whereas um, we see, uh, whereas by the 19th century, we, see, we start to see emerging um, a couple of features that we would see as recognizable to science today. So first of all, um, first of all, and extremely importantly, we see uh, the emergence of a, um, of a pretty robust uh, industry in publishing um, academic, uh, like academic and scholarly journals about medicine, right? So uh, if you are an interested physician in the 1830s, you know, you might subscribe to several to several um, journals of medicine, right? In which doctors would, uh, you know, these these could, they could, they would often just be sort of case reports. Doctors would send in, I saw this interesting case of cholera or ophthalmia, yeah. something like that. Um, and so you would so you would have so your uh, your access to these scholarly networks was uh, never much further than uh, never much further than what you could get through the mail, basically. Um, so in that sense, we have uh, much denser networks of communication. And that way, um, we also have the emergence of the laboratory as a place for doing research. So um, we start to see in the, 18, well, right around the 1830s, uh, the development, like the really, again, um, concerted development of laboratories as a space where you can sort of isolate parts of living organisms and figure out how they work, basically. Um, right, so again, this is very different from clinical observation, which is when you're dealing with the whole, with the whole patient. Um, and so we start to see this as uh, you know these these special spaces being developed and and being trusted to um, to come up with you know uh, if not clinically useful information then scientifically useful information which again would then get conveyed uh, through these um, uh, through the medium of these of these widely circulating publications uh, to to wider audiences um, and the final thing we see is that particularly towards the end of the 19th century you start to see the emergence of like international congresses. Right, so these are um, these are sort of events like where you would uh, where all of the um, you know, all the usually the leading researchers from or, or at least you know people with enough money to sort of travel to one of these things um, would go and you could hear you could you know, meet you, you could meet people and uh, and discuss your research or you can go and see talks about you know the latest in sanitation and hygiene for instance um, and again all of this all of this forms a um, all this forms a, a very robust network of exchange. Um, doesn't, of course, doesn't doesn't lead to standardization or homogeneity, at least not at once, right? Uh, so there's it's still possible to have many different theories flying and many people uh, doing things. Again, theory and practice can be different, um, but yeah, but we see something that looks not not uh, not entirely like our like what we think of as sort of scientific exchange now, but uh, something certainly more uh, more vigorous than what we would have seen in the uh, 
13th, 14th, 14th, 15th, and 16th centuries. So, let's see. So, maybe on that note, uh, on the on the note of ideas that, um, uh, oops, where did I go? I think I just stopped my own video. There we go. Um, so on the note of the, uh, so thinking about uh, questions of how uh, scientific ideas uh, get picked up and how sort of things that seem obvious to us might, uh, might not seem obvious at the time. And, and thinking about this sort of very, uh, very, again, rich and nuanced discussion of uh, things like etiology in the, um, uh, in the 19th century, etiology just being like the causes of disease in the 19th century. Uh, maybe it's a good time to move on to uh, this, this final, uh, final section on germ theory um, and the germ theory of disease. Um, and so one thing that we haven't talked about uh, is the question of uh, when the cholera bacteria was, uh, was first discovered, right? So um, I did say that we would get to a germ theory of disease, and of course a germ theory of disease um, has, 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 uh, has the cholera bacillus at its, um, at its center. Uh, and so we might well ask, okay, so well, you know, when was, when was cholera bacteria discovered? When did people know that it was caused by a bacteria and not by miasmas? Um, and so the short answer is that cholera bacteria was isolated as early as, the, as 1854 uh, by the Italian physician uh, Filippo Piccini. Uh, the credit is usually given to the famous German bacteriologist Robert Koch for his identification of the so-called comma bacillus uh, around 1833, 1834, excuse me, 1883, 1884. The longer answer, however, uh, gets us to the question of what it means to understand and intervene. And this is a question that we uh, were talking about last time as well. Uh, because one might reasonably assume that the discovery of cholera, of the cholera bacteria was a watershed moment in public health, uh, as it certainly was in some respects. Um, and yet, the curious fact is that even after the discovery of disease-causing microbes, even after the widespread medical acceptance of the germ theory, uh, for many in the medical profession, it was still not clear that the cholera microbe was the cause of cholera. Uh, this was not, I should say, for lack of imagination. So uh, here we see a somewhat satirical reflection on the idea that creatures live in droplets of water. Um, and this is from 1850. Uh, and if we zoom in, we notice that pestilence is one of these uh, is one of these sort of entities that this cartoonist is postulating as um, as potentially living in droplets of water. And so again, this tells us first of all that uh, that, that uh, microscopy was at least common enough that it could be uh, satirized. And, uh, and again, and this person, the person who's writing this sort of views, views thoughts of uh, the social lives of, of microbes as kind of silly. Um, but this person is also saying that the, that is also sort of gesturing at the possibility that uh, among the social lives of microbes could be the problem of disease, right? And so here is, here's pestilence. Um, or a slightly more serious example, uh, here too is a riff on the idea of, uh, of the old poem, The House That Jack Built. Um, and so the idea here is that, so this is the water that John drinks in this glass uh, and the water comes from the River Thames. Um, the River Thames is full of these, uh, well, the poem calls them fish, but as you can see from the illustration, they're not like, they look more like microbes than fish, right? So these are microorganisms that live in the water that, uh, that John will then come and drink. And then finally, we see that the microbes are fed off the sewage that empties into the Thames. And so the sewage feeds the microbes and then uh, John gets his water from the river and, uh, John drinks it, and then presumably John gets sick. Right? And so the idea here is that, again, um, the idea here is there's, there's sort of an idea, that a, an imaginary, um, or an imagination, a fantasia of the idea that um, um, disease causes, um, that microbes cause, cause disease. Okay, so it's not for lack of, it's not like people were un, incapable of imagining a microbial source of disease, um, nor is it uh, for lack of what we would today call epidemiological evidence. Uh, so perhaps some of you are familiar with this map. Uh, this is one of the most famous artifacts of the cholera years. This is the physician John Snow's uh, 1854 uh, map of Broad Street in London during a cholera epidemic. And so the idea here is that each of these blocks uh, represents a case of cholera. And by charting the cases of cholera on this block, Snow proved that the source of cholera in this neighborhood was one pump. So this pump right here. Um, and Snow, uh, Snow was in fact a contagionist. Uh, he believed that cholera was conveyed in water through what he called morbid matter or sometimes even cells. Um, 
And the thought that he had was that these cells, I guess, uh, sort of got into the body of the patient, uh, sort of multiplied within the body of the patient, uh, got into the body of the patient through water, multiplied, causing cholera, and then were excreted uh, only to be consumed by another patient on the line, where they would sort of, uh, repeat the process, right? Um, so, of course, this seems very right to us today. It seems very much like John Snow nailed some, a proof of the germ theory of disease. But as his colleagues pointed out, uh, John Snow had not actually found any uh, contagious matter in the water, certainly not any cells. Um, actually, all he had done was postulate it. And, uh, and so for, the, for people who are of a miasmatic bent, uh, rather than contagionism per se, it was just as easy to imagine that uh, a deadly choleric miasma caused by filth had simply dissolved in the water, like carbon dioxide in a bottle of seltzer, right? Um, and so whatever was the case, the solution uh, was clear. Right? The, it was the city's responsibility to provide clean water to take care of, uh, of the water coming out of that pump. Uh, and so here in 1866, uh, we see a cartoon in which uh, cholera, uh, shown here again as a shrouded skeleton and wearing a crown, so you know this is cholera because of because uh, it is king cholera. Um, cholera is sort of dispensing, I guess, dispensing itself to the uh, impoverished people of this parish. Uh, and, the client, uh, and the caption says, death's dispensary, open to the poor, free by permission of the parish. Right? And so the idea here is that whether, uh, whether you believe uh, that Jon Snow had proved um, that, uh, that water was a conveyance of contagion or, of, or uh, the conveyance of a miasma, uh, what is clear is that it is the uh, it is the responsibility of the parish, in this case, the local government, uh, to, to provide clean water. Right? And so, uh, again, we see in this case then not a lack of imagination and not a lack of what we would think of as uh, epidemiological evidence, um, but what was lacking in the middle of the 19th century, uh, again, but not at the end, uh, was the political sensibility, uh, was a political sensibility that was accommodating of the germ theory. So remember the germ theory of disease is clearly one of contagionism. And contagionism was associated with quarantines, with surveillance of individuals, with restrictions of individual movements and liberties, and with social unrest, with riots like this one uh, that ended with doctors and public officials being uh, pursued and beaten. Uh, these are exactly the sorts of things both public health reformers and physicians wanted to avoid in the early 19th century. Miasmatism or anti-contagionism was associated with public works, with prosperity, with state benevolence, with social harmony. Uh, here you can see um, the official vigilance. So this, this is just cleanliness, the, the light of cleanliness, um, sort of forcing uh, cholera, shown here uh, as this figure, uh, cholera and other diseases back into the shadows, right? Um, and keeping them out of, the, out of the city. And of course, um, here the caption says, at the gates, our safety depends on official vigilance. And right? so this is saying that it's the, state's, the state is responsible for um, for producing this uh, sort of cleanliness, prosperity, and social harmony uh, in, the pursuit of, uh, in the pursuit of the elimination of disease. Um, all this said, uh, th thus said, uh, even when faced with strong evidence then, uh, even evidence as strong as bacterial cultures of cholera, um, many sanitary reformers refused to accept wholeheartedly uh, that, cholera, that cholera bacteria were important elements of disease. Uh, we can see one famous case, uh, this is as late as 1892, of a very well-respected socially, socially liberal physician, this is Max von Pettenkoffer, um, who went so far as to drink a glass of cholera just to prove that it wasn't infectious. Uh, and he did not, in fact, get very sick. And therefore, he felt that he had conclusively shown that cholera bacillus did not cause cholera. Nevertheless, whereas in 1854, Debate still raged about what the state's role in preventing epidemic sickness was. By 1892, the question was largely settled. A modern state was one that married its tremendous organizational power with scientific discovery in order not simply to enable the health of its populations, but to enforce healthy practice. And under these conditions, germ theory provided a powerful validation of public health enforcement. Disease was no longer simply a social condition or a property of certain people. It could be seen as an alien invader, a violator of national sovereignty. And so uh, Pettenkoffer's rather dramatic protest aside, by the end of the century, the germ theory of disease was cemented not simply as a way, as a scientific or theoretical way of thinking about disease, but as a practical one. Uh, practical insofar as it authorized uh, 
new radical powers in the name of fighting a, a novel enemy that is the germ, right? So um, it mandates things like, for instance, the testing of individuals for disease, right? Uh, in this case, cholera bacteria. And so here we see um, a, a British doctor testing, uh, testing some soldiers in India here. Um, this new, this new sort of the germ theory authorizes also new powers or puts a premium on things like uh, the discovery and distribution of vaccinations. So it makes it a responsibility of the state to at least underwrite the pursuit of vaccinations and it also enables the state um, to vaccinate people, to mandate vaccinations. And again, uh, here is a British doctor uh, in colonial India um, uh, immunizing a soldier. And so the point here is that it was not germ theory that changed public health. Rather, it was the rise of a movement of concerted state-run public sanitation that provided a fertile bed for the widespread acceptance of germ theory. By the 1900s, pandemic cholera was no longer the threat that it had seemed to be in the 1830s. It still existed and exists today, uh, causing great suffering. But vaccination, sanitation, and eventually in 1910, a cure had blunted its force. Pandemic cholera had, however, left its mark in the ways in which large industrialized states thought about the importance of disease, and public health had expanded the reach of these states across global empires. We'll talk more about these global empires next time when we discuss the 1918 pandemic influenza, the influenza pandemic, excuse me. Uh, and so now let's move on to uh, I guess a discussion of some of the uh, sources, or so the readings that we had uh, for this week. Well, we have a couple of final questions that we wanted to pose and then um, to move on to the discussion. Uh, so let me just relay some of these ones here. Uh, so this question is, when did the importance of water for rehydration become widely recognized? We had a dramatic experience in Barbados this, in 19, 1854 with 20% of the population killed because of inadequate water. And this question came from Professor Henry Fraser from Barbados. Oh, okay, so um, yeah, so there are various attempts at rehydration uh, therapy before 1910. So, so 1910 is when the first sort of efficacious rehydration therapy um, uh, sort of, uh, comes into being. Um, it, before that, so people had uh, people had tried various sorts of rehydration. Turns out you need something. Uh, you need not just like sort of uh, saline water. Um, you need water with sugar in it, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but the whole point is that you, you sort of, sort of balance, the, uh, balance the chemicals in water, um, you, so you can't simply rehydrate people um, with water. Uh, and this by 1910 was, was uh, well understood um, and became a fairly common, common cholera treatment when, when it was available. Cool. And then uh, our last question uh, is a connection between this lecture and the previous one. Uh, at the end of the previous lecture, Emily posed a question about a surprising connection between plague and cholera. To restate her question, what is the most surprising connection between plague and cholera that you have found? Okay, so yeah, this is a, um, this is a tough one to answer. I think um, I'm usually more surprised by discontinuities than continuities. Um, I mean, so there's a couple of things. I mean, first of all, there is the, um, there is a, there is a direct connection insofar as at least early on, people would uh, uh, some people would uh, speculate that cholera was plague return, and we see this again in 1918 as well. So the idea that um, that one one reaction is to sort of compare one epidemic to the next, right, and literally think, well, uh, cholera is as fast acting as plague. Maybe it is in fact plague, you know, and we don't have, you know, uh, it's possible to interpret some of the symptoms as plague-like. Um, so that was, you know, that's certainly uh, surprising how frequently that that uh, recurs. Um, and then there is a certain uh, a certain uh, continuity. Well, continuity is the wrong word, but a, a similarity between um, uh, just the, the various sorts of reactions uh, can be mapped onto each other in general terms uh, remarkably well. Things like social unrest, things like scapegoating, um, happen uh, uh, astoundingly frequently in, in many many forms of epidemic and pandemic disease. Um, I guess whether that's surprising or not depends on how one thinks about, you know, the, how, one, how one approaches the problem of the human condition. Um, so uh, I guess the thing that the, it's actually the discontinuities that, uh, one of the big discontinuities that we touched on um, in sort of the first part of the lecture uh, is the one that sort of surprised me the most, which is the shift from thinking about, um, from depicting uh, disease as, uh, as death itself, right, as, as the, 
as the, the sort of the terminal point of, or the, the, uh, the, the undesirable terminal point of the disease uh, to think about uh, disease as monstrous, but not necessarily like, not necessarily just death, right? Um, um, and so you see this also with other diseases like cholera, you see you know, typhus depicted as a snake, just to call, up, call one image to mind. Or, you know, or, or in fact, you know, retrospective, retro, like paintings of plague done in the 19th century also tend to show plague as more monstrous rather than death-like. Um, and so that's interesting. Uh, that's interesting to me just insofar as um, it hints at, uh, well, it hints as, at a different understanding of, you know, of the scope of disease and of its causes, right? It's still something grotesque, but it's not, um, it's not something that's simply as inevitable as death itself. Um, maybe we should turn to the documents and talk about yes. them. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do here is I'll stop my screen share and I'll pull up the documents. Uh, which one do which one should we start? Should we start well, with why don't we start at the beginning and talk about the broadsheet? Let's do the broadsheet. Because I think it so powerfully conveys ideas about okay, let me... treatment. Yes. And what is needed for proper treatment. It's quite a regime. Yes. Oops, I just did the wrong thing, sorry. Uh, forgive my lack of proficiency with Zoom here. One second, okay. So I'm going to share screen, portion, share. I'm going to share this portion. There we go. So that looks okay to you? Let me just widen it a little. Okay. Yes, yeah, so there is the prescription for cholera morbus. Um, so it's a, li a list of, of household ingredients. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, these are, um, well, as I sort of, as we, as we discussed last time, like these are the list of household ingredients and we had, um, we had asked the, uh, asked the people watching to sort of, to sort of uh, speculate as to what common uh, properties these had. And many people pointed out uh, that these are all things that are hot, right? Uh, so, uh, so the first thing to note is that, you know, these are these household ingredients. So these are not, these are not things which would be especially hard to get. Um, but these are all things that would, that would warm, warm up a body. Right. Um, and then, and then Emily, you further made the observation here that, so not only these are these warming ingredients, um, but also, uh, this, this list of directions that you have to go through. Um, I mean, it's a real, like, it's a real, um, this is a real chore, right? You have to like, this is a real sort of like step-by-step uh, -step list of sort of, you know, uh, rituals that you have to like, uh, you have to make sure the patient's uh, sweating and then you, you rub their hands and then you can't let them sleep, right? And there's all this, you know, um, and it provides a sort of step and what to expect. Um, so it's a real process. It's a real uh, process. Yeah. And then, you, and then it, it's, it's something you really have to work for because for example, you have to stay in this state for two to three hours the patient must not fall asleep. So here you are in this miserable paste that you've also rubbed powerfully and uninterruptedly on your hands and feet. And we talked about that too. Why the hands and feet? It's about sort of perhaps a response to everyone turning blue from cholera, right? Yeah, it could be that. It could be, um, you know, I suspect it also, I mean, it's, it's, it also is warming, right? And it, and I, I don't know, I think it feels good too, you know, so if there's like an aspect to it, not, not that all this, not that all these medicines would feel good, but. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, this doesn't, this sounds somewhat uh, difficult. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's, it's, uh, this is, this is a tough, it's a, it's a tough regimen. Um, but I think that the, so the thing to, the, the thing I would want people to take away from this, especially, especially sort of, if, if we think about, um, if we think about many of the, the uh, therapeutic, um, Therapeutic interventions that we saw in plague, and then we're gonna and then we're gonna look uh, next time at, at influenza, at the pandemic influenza. Um, one thing we see is that, uh, or one thing to note, as you said, is like the patient has to work for it, right? So this is um, uh, so medicine in this period is is uh, certainly by the, in the by the middle of the 19th century that starts to change, uh, but before that, medicine is very much an interactive kind of process, right? So um, the example that I that I tend to use is that. You know, today, if I go to my doctor and she diagnoses me as having um, high cholesterol, first of all, I can't, I can't feel that I have high cholesterol. 
And then she puts me on, I guess, statins for that, right? And I can't feel a statin working, right? The only way that I know, the only way I know anything's happening is because I, I guess I go in back to the lab in a couple of months, get blood drawn, and my doctor either says it's okay or not, right? And then if not, then we do another medicine that I still can't feel working. Whereas you can imagine, um, and, and many, uh, a great many cures of the period are like this. You can imagine at each step of the way, the patient is really going to feel stuff happening, right? And we'll be reporting back to the doctor or, or the person that's taking care of them, right? So, I mean, this stuff will really like, you know, it, it, it has, um, you, you taste and feel things and your, your body's responsive perspiration. All this is like, all this is a, um, it's a property of the medicine, right? It's a way of, uh, it's a way that the patient and the doctor like can know that the medicine is doing something, right? Um, which is, again, which is something that we will begin to see less of, um, well, we'll begin to see less of it uh, uh, during the 1918 pandemic and even, uh, and even less as we move to sort of the middle of the 20th century. Um, for the record, my internet connection is unstable. So if I appear uh, not to be responsive, that's why. Um, <laughs> uh, I'll work on that. Yeah, I, I, but the other thing that is striking is the way that, I mean, this is related to what you're saying. Oh, just froze. Is that medicine is somehow accessible, right? You can access this regime of treatment with household goods. Um, it's not some mysterious, highly technological, really refined process with which you're deeply familiar to today. And the person, the patient has to be really actively involved in it, like you say, in a way that with many of our medications today, it's sort of this inferior process and a, re a prescription drug that we don't really need to, we don't need to know how it works to, to take right. it or be involved in that. Yeah, I mean, in fact, my understanding is it can be a, it can be a, a pain for physicians when, you know, when their patients have gone on WebMD or whatever and, and know, you know, and you know, slight, slightly enough, but not enough to, you know, know just enough to, um, to intervene partially on their own behalf and things. Right. Um, yeah, whereas exactly, especially with something like this, which is very much a humoral, this is not a miasmatic intervention that we're looking at here. This is a humoral intervention. Um, people probably have some sense of how humors worked too. You know, you wouldn't, so the, the doctor's job is to just, is to be, um, is to sort of bring out the complexity of humoral theory. But you would know, you know, you might know the cleric is that, that you have too much cholera in cases of cholera, right? You, it wouldn't be, uh, and you would sort of understand the principles at work, um, which again, compared to the statin, you know, um, I certainly don't, I could look it up, but certainly off the top of my head, I don't know how a statin, how a statin works or why. And um, you don't need to be involved in it's I don't need to, right? baking to be able to take it and for it to have some effect on you. Yes, right. There's, there's no way that I can make a statin with the ingredients that are currently in my cupboard, whereas... Um, <laughs> I have, I have some pretty good white wine vinegar downstairs. <laughs> wine, I've definitely got some garlic. You know, I mean, I've got most of these ingredients actually downstairs. So. Well, you could go try it. I can go whip myself up some cure but for cholera morbus. Maybe we should move on to the next. The other reading that attracted attention from some of our viewers in our lecture was um, the governor's yes. address. Enos Throop. Um, there was uh, Linda Lowe, who was one of our audience members from, from that lecture, notes that at the end, or on page 394 and 94 of that, six and seven in the PDF, I think, um, that there is this compelling parallel that she sees with today's placing the blame for our pandemic on others mm -hmm. and calls for watching the border with Canada and other points of entry. Yeah. Referring to immigrants and cleanliness and the, quote, enfeebling dissipations and excesses, also the scrooging of the human race for its sins, sins, uncleanliness, and intemperance. Yeah. Um, so why did you put this reading for us? Well, uh, well exactly as uh, was uh, uh, this is uh, the questioner's name was Lowe, is that right? Linda Lowe, yes. Linda Lowe, yeah. So uh, the, exactly as, uh, as Linda Lowe was saying, like it is, it is precisely for that, um, just to just sort of give us a, a moment to reflect upon um, uh, the, again, the sort of similarity between this approach and, uh, and the other uh, and, and prior pandemics, right? So we can, um, we can see, well, first of all, we can see that one doesn't need a germ theory in order to, uh, in order to 
place the blame for disease on on others and to do things like restricting commerce or well restricting commerce not not all commerce but specifically immigrants right um and um uh, and certainly, but then, then of course, there is also this, you know, we see an idea that there is, uh, you know, that there are, that there's a certain amount, there's a certain notional justice to sickness in this case, right? So, uh, you know, the, um, the, the people who are, uh, who are both sick and in danger of infecting everyone are, are, are unworthy and they've, they've done something wrong that deserves scourging, right? Um, uh, and so it was, you know, it's, there's a sort of complex logic here, right? So if, if one would imagine if you've done nothing wrong, then what do you have to fear? But in fact, this is a sort of a, a way of both blaming others and and um, uh, and elevating sort of elevating the group that is not uh, that is not yet sick. Um, Emily, you had pointed something out about the the nature of the commerce too, as I recall. Yeah, that that the, there are two sources, according to the governor, as I recall, of cholera, and one is you know, people, immigrants, questionable immigrants. And the other is uh, merchandise, in particular, rags. Rags, right. Rags. Yeah. I, thought that was, I thought that was a great observation because it like, it really does get at this idea that, um, that again, well, you can, you can sort of see how selectively a quarantine might be applied, right? So it's not, um, it's not like fine textiles that are, that you're worried about containing cholera. It's, it's rags, which of course, rags are, are the things that, um, immigrants would want to, squalid immigrants would want to bring with them or want to traffic in, right? And so um, you can see this very, again, it's a very, uh, what's that, it's, I was gonna say it's a subtle system. I guess it's a not so subtle system for, um, for affixing, uh, for, for both explaining disease or explaining, explaining disease, but explaining in terms of sort of a, uh, a social order that, again, presumably uh, the government thinks would have been very transparent to, uh, uh, to his constituents or to the people that he's speaking to. Is that the last, can you go to the last paragraph of this one? We have another, uh, one of our other audience members. Um, was it on this document made the observation, Jean Perkins made the observation of this sort of co combination of fear and state power that is really mm -hmm. <laughs> necessary for good public health. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what was the, uh, what was the, uh, oh, this was for, uh, this was for this, and wasn't it also for, um, was it not also for this one, for uh, Cholera at the Fair? Yes, I'm sorry, it was, it was for Cholera at the Fair. That's right, yeah. So this one, um, so this one was definitely, uh, this was both a, uh, I included this one, first of all, because, um, well, you know, of course, the University of Chicago is, is, uh, is built adjacent to the, 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 uh, the fairgrounds of which they're speaking to, to here, right? So you know, I can I can look out my my office window when I when I finally get back to my office, and I can see uh, you know I can see this this midway where the fair once was, and so there's a little bit of sort of there's both the, this, the geographical resonance, but yeah, but also one gets a sense of um, yeah, one gets a sense of the way that uh, that uh, they are calling for uh, that the, the people in this article are calling for uh, the people who wrote this article are calling for, uh, but the 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 exercise of just enough fear to uh, to keep people in line, but not like not so much fear that causes panic, right? And they're saying, uh, and there's a really clear call for for government intervention, but again, not too much intervention. So it's a, uh, it's again, it's this very sort of subtle um, uh, subtle document. Yeah, again, yeah. There, there you go. These are the rags here. So they are the rags. Yeah. All right. I think I was merging the governor and the world expo Colombian exposition documents. Well, they're, yeah, well, that's, they're very, sim they're similar in their own ways. Although, um, yeah, they're similar in that, in that, in that sort of as attributing the, the cause to immigrants and again, small immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, but again, they're, they're, it's, uh, as, as, as is being pointed out, it's, um, it's useful to, um, it's useful to contrast them as well because uh, like Troop is calling for closing borders, but he's not calling for that much control. Whereas by 1893, um, this document is calling for some, some significant state power to be leveraged on, uh, on the control of cholera. It, and here's that phrase, while undue alarm is to be deprecated, some degree of fear for the possible consequences of neglect is necessary. Oh, you lost it. To stimulate the adoption of the precautionary measures recommended in the report. 
right? And without it, without it, the authorities would not be justified in incurring the expenditures which such precautionary measures will entail. I mean, it's remarkable, right? So we need we need just enough fear to justify the cost, but not too much more. And to be effective, because to be too effective, much fear right. would also they presumably when it comes to the exposition, then right? Yeah, right. So, yeah, exactly. So, um, which again, I think you know you can see um, that certainly would uh, that certainly that that's a sentiment that would not be out of place in our you know in our current discussions over mm -hmm. when and how to reopen and you know uh, how much should people worry about social distancing and the um, yeah, how much, how much, uh, how much uh, a probium should be placed on people that don't wear masks when they jog, or you know, or, or whatever, right? or any you know, list, list any number of other other forms of behavior. Yeah, uh, maybe we should talk about the other the Lancet article. Yes, because that also relates to the question that came up propped up earlier about um, about uh, contagion. Well, and also about medical research, because this right. is quite a, a scientific piece. And ultimately, as I recall, you mentioned this man met a tragic end because of his pen and copper. Yes, that's true. Scientific yeah. beliefs. So perhaps you can elaborate a bit on that. Yeah. So well, so the reason I included, um, and again, this is uh, well, I said this last time. I guess I'll I'll say it again, which is that if if I had been quicker in thinking about the poll function. It would be interesting, the poll function on Zoom. It would have been interesting to see how many people knew the name uh, Max von Pettenkoffer versus how many knew someone like Louis Pasteur, right? <laughs> um, I would, I would, I'd be willing to bet that probably fewer people know Pettenkoffer than Pasteur, right? Um, and that is, and that's, you know, and that's because, of course, you know, we think of Pettenkoffer, so Pettenkoffer is famous as this, um, He's not a germ theory denier, but he definitely didn't, he didn't think that cholera bacillus caused cholera, right? He was a miasmatist through and through. And in fact, was in his time, a, extremely famous as a, uh, as a social reformer. You know, he was sort of, uh, he was on the forefront of championing uh, municipal reforms to bring, uh, you know, clean water and uh, good ventilation to, uh, to the poor of Europe, uh, particularly of, um, of what would become Germany. Um, and so, you know, again, uh, sort of this, this well-known figure uh, who completely drops off because uh, because his his skepticism to germ theory um, makes him seem foolish. And in fact, uh, in fact, he uh, eventually, I believe, I believe, in 1901, uh, commits suicide uh, uh, in in, uh, in no small part because he sort of he experienced this rapid um, this rather rapid decline in his in his sort of reputation and the seriousness with which people took him. Um, and so, the reason why I, why I included this was because I really wanted to. I wanted to sort of um, really emphasize that it is not, uh, and this is true of many cases in the history of medicine, uh, it's not the case that Pettenkoffer was, uh, was a bad scientist. I guess this is, this is the, the short of it is that actually you can see he's very, very careful with how he does his, with how he structures his, um, his response to uh, Koch and the idea of the cholera bacillus, right? You can see he's saying, well, listen, like I understand that there's a cholera bacillus involved. It's possible, you know, possibly it, um, it possibly responds to, uh, to miasmas. I don't even know if he uses the word miasma, but that's the idea. Um, you know, uh, so he's very, he's very carefully like sort of building, uh, building up a evidence for his theory. Um, and yet there is plenty that actually cholera bacillus can't explain, right? Uh, can't explain why uh, cholera happens at certain times of year, can't explain why it happens, um, or why, why it's more frequently happens at certain times of year, can't explain why it tends to more frequently um, uh, in fact, uh, people again who live in "quote unquote" filth rather than rather than everyone, right? And so now, of course, we can do this. But um, anyway, Pettenkoffer does things like uh, you know he he doesn't just sort of postulate a miasmatic theory. He also does things like he tests he tests the ground, right? He's sort of he's very interested in the porosity of particular types of soil, so the kind of porous soil that might let miasma up. And I think he finds that um, sure enough, in places that uh, have a lot of cholera, there's also porous soil. Um, so yeah, so all this to say that I wanted to really convey that um, it's first of all, it's no easy thing to like. It seems very obvious uh, to us right now that that once you have a once you have a germ theory, that everything should just like fall into place, right? Um, but actually, the, you know, uh, it's very it was possible to come up with some very um, you know well reasoned uh, well reasoned arguments against it, and and again, um, and possible to argue on the grounds 
you know, both of scientific truth and of social utility that, um, that we, we really don't need a germ theory. Uh, so that's why I included this. So you can get a real sense of the, 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 the granularity of uh, Penn Conference research. Not well, and it's also interesting where it's published. I mean, right in the Lancet. That's true. Right. Um, yeah, Penn Conference is an interesting case because he publishes. I uh, can't remember the figure, but he. I, I don't think I'm wrong in saying that he that they, he he wrote thousands of pages on the question of cholera. So he was like the the leading expert of, of cholera. It's just this really vigorous again a vigorous researcher who is, um, you know, I guess in some ways, uh, yeah. Well, it's almost I guess completely wrong for the right reasons. Does that work? Out? I think, yeah. I think, yeah. Zoe, are there any, I think that gives us a good sense of the readings. Shall I, yeah, uh, is there, there anything? Thing? Oh yeah, you could put it back to your. Oops. And oh, there's our credits, which we'll put up. Uh, well, we'll just put this bibliography online. Maybe we can go here. Yes. Um, should Zoe, I, are there any further big questions we should address? Um, I think we hit most of the big ones. Uh, we've covered a lot of the comments from from the readings, which was something that people were very interested in. We got a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of positive feedback about the readings, so I think that was yeah. really great. Well, I think that we will bring this event to its conclusion then. Oh, could you go back one? I want to speak to that particular yeah. slide. There we go. I do want to invite you to come to our next lecture, which is coming up on Wednesday, June 3rd, and it's Modern Medicine in the Time of Pandemic Influenza. Uh, you can sign up and we hope to see you then. And then, of course, I want to invite you to, next slide, Consider taking a class with us at Graham where you will experience, as Zoe so eloquently put it, instructors who are devoted to the art of discussion. And one further thing I'll add is we also have Zoom training sessions for our classes so that uh, students who are interested in taking a class but are a little unsure of how Zoom might work in a classroom setting um, will learn how to do that. Uh, and then finally, I do want to thank Zoe Eisenman for her work as the academic director of Graham generally, and then more specifically for being with us here today. And Michael Rossi, I really want to thank you for what was an excellent lecture, very illuminating, and I really look forward to learning more about influenza from you next week. And of course, I also thank all of our viewers out there. So thank you for watching this video and we hope that you tune in soon to the next episode. Thanks. Thank you. Take care.